Hi there. So the Centre for Welfare Reform sounds like a scary title, particularly given that description of what welfare reform means in practice. Um, the Centre for Welfare Reform is an independent Sheffield-based organisation. I set it up about four years ago. And I think we mean by welfare reform pretty much the opposite of what the government is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but, but I think as Francis touched on, I think there are real issues about the old design of the welfare state while this government is kicking that to death, uh, there are still fundamental issues about what a fair and decent settlement looks like. But what I'm going to talk about is work that I've been doing on behalf of the Campaign for a Fair Society, which is, again, an independent campaign uh, across the UK, um, which very much focuses on disability. Um, and these, these initial slides kind of play as a little film. I, pro I will talk a little bit as they play out. Um, and then I've left, I've kind of, this will only take 10 minutes, and then I'm going to open up to questions, uh, and I've got some other stuff for people to talk about it. I suppose the, differ the big difference here is I want to stand a little bit further back than Francis did, because Francis is looking at this thing called welfare reform, which uh, current calculations, government said it's going to save 22 billion by uh, 2015 in annual terms. Actually, that's part of um, an even bigger set of cuts. And it's really interesting to look at where all of those cuts fall. And it turns out that they fall particularly harshly on disabled people. So everybody knows this, big cuts in spending. Uh, what people don't know is that they actually target the people with the greatest need. Um, in real terms, the figure for 2015, 72 billion, uh, that's a cut of the welfare state by 10%. You can have an argument about whether it's necessary to make cuts at all, but the, what the cuts that are made are not fair. They fall hardest on the people we should put first. So how has this happened? Well, primarily, it's because the cuts have been targeted in two particular areas. If you look at the cuts to local government and the cuts to benefits and tax credits, they're far and away the biggest proportion of the 72 billion. Mm -hmm. So, local government, actually in proportional terms, local government has been cut higher than anything else, and benefits second. And these are not the biggest things in, local, in no. government spending. Um, if you look at uh, where the cuts are targeted, benefits local government, more than half of all the cuts in those two places. Okay. But if you then look at government spending and how that's distributed, that's benefits, that's local government. Yes, so the, the, the cuts have not been done fairly, they've done, not been done across the board. 25% is taking 50% in terms of spending. And what does local government do? Primarily, as far as these cuts are concerned, it provides social care. 60% of local government non-ring fence spending is for social care. That's where the cuts to local government have to fall. So the cuts fall on some people much more than other people. Um, they fall on... 39% of the cuts fall on 21% of people in poverty, 29%, 8% disabled people, 15% fall on the 2% of people with the most severe disabilities. Average person, £467, person in poverty, 2195 five times more. Disabled person, 4410 nine times more. Person with severe disabilities needing social care, 8832 19 times more. <laughs> so, of course, in reality, it's very complex. Um, different individuals will suffer even more, and some individuals will suffer less, and it's a complex picture. Um, but when you put all those things together, there's a kind of logic to it. If you want to read more about that, there's a report that we uh, produced uh, that you can read. It's free to download. Um, and so, if people want to talk about that, oh, it's set off on its own, that's all right. Hopefully that's the last one, that's a difference. So, that's, that's the work I've been involved in, in, amongst other things, trying to look at what's, what's really going on. And again, it's very, one of the things that's very difficult 
sometimes in this debate is that the way in which the debate often happens is very fragmented. So, the, uh, in fact, the welfare reform is a good example of this. The cut is dressed up as, oh, we're not cutting anything, we're reforming DLA. But actually, <laughs> you know, the government's plan to save about one and a half billion from DLA is clear if you go to, down to the detail. And their intention to save 22 billion from benefits, which was ma a statement made at the autumn 2012, actually every year they've increased their targets for what they're going to save from benefits. It started at only 8 billion. Uh, so from 8 to 18 to 22 in three years. So they make these fiscal targets quite independently of this um, over-reforming the system, which is, I think, a very curious thing to see. Um, why is this happening might be one of the critical questions. Um, Can you just move the, 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 the chart that you had? You couldn't see the percentages on the left-hand side. We should just explain that chart. Oh, this one. Well, this is slight. Yes, I only put this one in because I thought if people wanted to ask, this is actually just showing the levels of tax paid by different percentiles of the population. So it's actually the poorest 10% of the population pay the highest percentage of tax, 45%. So it's just one of the many injustices which Francis touched on in the welfare state as it stands. This precedes what the government's doing. Okay, we've been living with this madness. I think he asked for a couple of decades. Figures out that left yeah. there. Where are they? Zero, fifty, hundred. Oh, thank no, you. Zero, twenty-five, fifty. No, no. Oh. <laughs> that's forty-five. All right, so I don't know. Thirty, sixty. Yeah. yeah. I, can, yeah. I can find out by taking it off this <laughs> and dragging my <laughs> thing over here. There you go. All right. Oh. 30, well, 40, this isn't look. See, this is what happens. When you try to talk about disability, everyone's talking about something else. You ought to test <laughs> it out. You ought to test this out. Before you. <laughs> oh, very sorry. <laughs> I accept your apology. <laughs> so anyway, this this is suppose is what the, the the main thing I just wanted to draw attention to is this kind of the injustice of it all and the particularly severe injustice as it's confronted by uh, disabled people and particularly people with the severest disabilities who get this. I mean, it's it's, it's almost a quadruple whammy because there were increased taxes on the poor. There have been benefit cuts around income. There are then disability-specific benefit cuts. And then there's huge social care cuts. Social care, by 2015, will be cut in real terms by 33%. We have never, ever, ever seen anything like this before. And yet, is it in the news? No. Okay. So there's a kind of interesting, I suppose, one, I don't know what questions people have, but there's, there's a really interesting thing going on in our society at the moment. Um, you know, the equality group are talking about the general set insensitivity to inequality, but it's kind of far worse than that. And it's gone from a kind of general, well, society's becoming more unequal, or are we really bothered by that or not, to something much, much more, much worse than that, very, very quickly. Mm. In which it's now become acceptable for politicians to stigmatise disabled people, mm. to use appalling language, to use language which no respectable academic would accept around um, benefits and this shirkers and strivers and all this crap. I can't think of any other word. I mean, this and this notion, and I suppose one of the things that I argue in the report is that what's going on here, maybe this is a, a, a tension, but what's going on here is not always quite um, the 1% and the 99%. That's an issue. But what's really going on here is a kind of politics of the middle. Elections are won in the middle, um, and what a lot of politics is doing, and a lot of it's smoke and mirrors, I accept, mm -hmm. but what a lot of the time politicians are trying to do is appeal to the middle. Um, and actually, um, that's why disabled people, and that's why people in poverty don't get a fair shake, because they are not politically powerful. Um, and, and so it's, at some level, I also think this is a design flaw in the welfare state. Because we've designed a system, you know, in the 1940s that all on the paper seemed very good, but has over time become more and more corrosive and, 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 and there's lacked, hasn't been successful in guaranteeing people's minimum incomes. In fact, what, what's really happening is it's not really supporting the basic incomes of every citizen. Uh, and it's becoming more and more punitive, more and more mm. targeted, and more and more, effectively, a kind of big middle class contract. Not to sound too Marxist, but that is kind of what goes on. 
and, and, and so this is, might sound controversial, but if, if you think about the cause of the economic crisis, the economic crisis was not caused by over-expenditure in benefits. Rubbish. Um, Correct. It was caused primarily by over-lending by banks. Yeah. Who were they lending to? Homeowners. Actually, kind of all homeowners. That was the, that's the central over-lending. Over and what, why were they doing that? Because homeowners, and I imagine, well, I'm a homeowner, I imagine some of you are in the room, homeowners like this, the value of my house keeps going up. <laughs> I'm getting wealthier and I'm not doing anything. In fact, I can now take out an even bigger mortgage because I'll get that money back. And so what this is, is what is called in economics a bubble. Mm. We've just mm. lived through a 20-year economic bubble of house price, unsustainable house price increases. But because politicians won't allow homeowners to suffer the pain of seeing that bubble burst, the pain is being moved to vulnerable communities, most of whom mm. don't own houses. Mm. And now we're even going to be kicked out of the houses that they have which have you know, because they can't afford to pay the rent. Mm. So that, that, I suppose, is just another angle that here. There is, there is a kind of a genuine desire uh, by some of us to try and improve, simplify, increase securities and rights in the welfare system, but that's got nothing really to do with what's going on. Uh, you know, I, what's really going on is, is the economics of shifting pain to weak political groups. Mm. Questions? Yes. My question to you is, do you think New Labour will rebalance it, this harm that's been done by this coalition government, if they do get in power in two and a bit years' time? Um, no. Basically. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think as well. So it needs some movement to change things. Yes, that's, what, that's, yeah. that's certainly my view. I think, of course, well, of course, it's maybe not of course, but I do think they probably wouldn't have been so dreadful. Uh, but actually, if you look at a couple of things, one is that you know a lot of the people powerfully in New Labour or whatever we call it now, new, do we call it New Labour, New, New, new Labour, or New Squared Labour, I don't know, whatever it is, the Ed Miliband Labour, were the key decision makers when they were in uh, power before, and the policies that they were pursuing actually have been kind of carried on by this government. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's yeah, actually yeah. not really fair to say that there's a completely different set of assumptions. Mm -hmm. And I spent a bit of my life working with or in touch with some of these people, and what comes over to me is a lot of them are basically out of touch, uh, mm -hmm. southerners with no real experience mm -hmm. of ordinary life, mm -hmm. and an arrogant assumption that they can make everybody's life better for them. They know how better people should live. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of the kind of Labour politicians you meet are as, almost as bad as the Tories. Mm -hmm. Sorry. There's a question in the back first. No, no, sort of yeah, question. Yeah, Basically, yeah. I think the key is to, as you just touched on it, is the demonisation of people on benefits. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And it's not new. There's people in this room, we were part of a group called Sheffield Welfare Action Network, and there was an occasion when we were interviewed by... Um, Radio 4, the Today programme, the, the Kim Catcher side was the journalist, she spent the whole day with us. The next day we were meant to be broadcast on um, the, the you know, Today programme in the morning, and John Hutton, who was the new Labour um, Works and Pensions Secretary at the time, mm -hmm. he said, if, that, if your, that package goes on the, on the radio, I'm walking, yeah. I'm not going on. And we encountered a lot of this, we encountered a lot, we monitored it. Um, at the time, it was very hard to get people interested. Um, I wrote to Greg Philo, who people might know of as uh, Glasgow University Monitoring Group, who did the miners' strike. And he said, oh, I haven't got any time for that. Ironically, he's now published exactly similar to what you've done, which is a document looking into the demonization of disabled people. Yeah, right. in the oh, I don't media. know that one, actually. Yeah. I suppose my question is, You've got to break through. I mean, it, it's it is systematic. It's not just the Daily Mail. It 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 started under Peter Lilly and then it moved on. And mm -hmm. I remember an interview with uh, John Battle MP being at the Church Poverty Action Group meeting, and he said, "I asked him this question. He's, he says yes. New Labour have got an obsession with people on benefits. 
And I think that's the that's the other heart of it was. You mentioned um, um, Labour politicians. Blunkett actually was quoted as saying, you know, people on incapacity benefit are lazy people who don't, um, you know, sit in front of the television all day. He, he wrote, we got a letter from the support group I'm involved with, and it basically he promised in it that no one on disability benefits would lose out. I've still got that letter, and at some point I'll pass it on to you. But my, my key thing would be, there's enough people here, we've got to start writing to the press, we've got to start the counter-offensive that they've created and that Conservatives have carried, well, and, and the Lib Dems, have, have pursued against disabled people. Because there's been suicides, there's been attempted yeah. suicides. Well, certainly I think in my discussion group that's, that's the question I'm going to be asking and I'd be very interested in people's no, ideas, okay. so maybe we'll save that discussion for then. I just put this slide up which relates to a point Francis made already. Benefit fraud, maybe about a billion. Yeah. Tax fraud, 15 billion. Unclaimed benefits and tax credits, 17 billion. Benefit cuts, 22 billion. Yeah. I think you could quite arguably say that the 22 billion plus the 17 is a 39 billion government fraud. Mm. You know, to steal money from people who are entitled to it is fraud. And so there's fraud by government. And again, I think, you know, the tax, this is not tax evasion, which is an even bigger figure, but this is just plain tax fraud. This is people cheating, everyday people cheating in their, in their tax claims. Um, that gets no attention. You know, and it was the Labour government that had posters up on the streets talking about uh, yes. benefit thieves. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're on yeah. Yeah. And this, 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 in statistical terms, is, is, is almost zero. I mean, this is an insignificant figure mm -hmm. for out of 180 billion of benefits and pensions. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's anybody in the room mm -hmm. that disagree with you. Yeah. So, questions? Well, just very briefly, um, I'd like to be able to access mm -hmm. all of the uh, yes. charts and uh, and uh, information you put up there. Is it all in the book or is, is it on the website or where can we access it? We can get it all from the, um, the Centre for Welfare Reform, either in our publications. The slides are mostly published on, we've got SlideShare, they're all live. Uh, I write for the Huffington Post and I've published a number of blogs on all these different topics we're talking about. So they're all in a whole bunch of different places actually. I, I, I'm Contact very... me directly if you like, Simon yeah. at sensibleworldfairreform.org. I, I think that the most important thing which uh, both of you touched on is uh, how do we talk to the non-converted? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Because the government is claiming them for their own. Uh, and we can't mm. argue with that because we don't have the proper information. Yeah. You've got a lot of it there. Um, uh, it really wants to be brought out in, into the open. So, I mean, if anybody else is in the room wants to work on that, uh, <coughs> do you live locally or? Yeah, I live in Mossbrook. Great. I'm very happy to have a follow-up conversation. Say, I read an article recently that the tax avoidance, as opposed to fraud, the yes. estimated loss of revenue is 105 billion pounds per money. year. That's for the whole tax avoidance yes, yeah. issue. And if that money was gathered in, then all of this that we're seeing wouldn't be required. And somebody said they'd need to double probably the size of HMRC to even begin to get there. But that would be a, 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 a very viable <coughs> estimate. And the irony of it is that some of the banks that we bailed out had actually tax avoidance sections within them um, advising businesses how to avoid paying tax. And so yeah. It's that that is really a major area of concern. I think it, it is. Right. I suppose I also think that we have to try and avoid <coughs> creating versions of the problem that shift responsibility either to this 1% or even to the Starbucks. Not that I think, I'm not justifying either extreme mad wealth or Starbucks, etc. But I do think sometimes part we also have to take a, a broader social responsibility for this. I just want to show you this slide, okay, which is, this, again, this is, this is all from uh, the Office of National Statistics. I've just taken this data straight from them. And, and I've done a simple calculation that anybody can do. This data is produced every year, okay? And every year, they say, for each 10% of the population, how many benefits do they receive and how much tax do they pay? All right, so all I've done is taken the, taken the benefits and taken the tax away, you see? So 
what the government tends to do is talk about benefits as costing 180 billion. It, it usually put when it wants to make the figure seem really large, it adds benefits and pensions together. It it does different things on different days. Um, but it's really interesting that out of that 100, 180, um, there's only um, there's actually 152 is paid straight back in taxes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So actually. Um, 60% of the population pay, they're worse off after taxes, yes? And 40% after benefits and taxes are a tiny bit better off. But can you see that huge difference between the 28 billion figure there and the 213 billion there? Okay, what is that difference? Well, actually, it's, thing, it's good things. It's like the NHS and all these other things. But what nobody ever really kind of observes that the difference then, so we spend a tiny amount, that's like 2 or 3% of GDP, on lifting people out of poverty. We spend an enormous amount of money on public services, which are of course actually salaries. And they're salaries of people here. <laughs> Mostly, they're salaries of people here. I mean, a doctor, a nurse <coughs> is here. Yeah. When we increase GP salaries from 80,000 a year to 100,000 a year, no poor people were better off. GPs were. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, I th and, and I'm just making this point because we have to not be naive about some of the economics here. We have to stop looking for a kind of ghost to blame that we'll never capture. And remember, it's actually about us. I think Francis meant it's about us working together as a society to for, come up with a just and fair settlement. Sorry, question there and then there. Yeah, my question was a little bit around that area, which is that. I think what worries me about what's going on is this idea that there's these... You shout it, Sorry, what's worrying me about what's going on is there's these benefit... People on benefits scrounging over here, and there's the rest of us, I mean, full-time work, over here. And this is what is, I think, really dangerous. This, this, this us and them has been built up, and there's a lot of myths around it as well, because when you start talking, what are benefits? And you, you're touching on it a bit there, is actually we all benefit from the tax take if you like in different ways and also we can all at any point fall into poverty you know there's stuff in the paper today that most people are one paycheck away from you know losing their i think third of people are yeah. one paycheck away from losing their house and when you stop and think about it you know that's the whole point of what this system was set up to do is a, you know, a kind of underpinning safety net for, for us and people in our families and people at different ages in the, in the life cycle. Somehow we've got to, I think, get this back. So we bridge what that guy at the front was talking about, about how we you know, work together because I, I'm, I'm very concerned about, because I think to some yeah. extent it's working, this wedge that's being driven in. I, I mean, my view is, and I've argued that in this sort of, it's not a view that's unique to me, you definitely need to look at something like a basic minimum income guarantee, citizen income. You need to merge the tax benefit system. And part of the reason you need to do that is you need to design universality in at the front end. So in a way, why do we have a benefit system? I and mean, a tax system is a system for giving and taking money away from people. A benefit system is for giving and taking money away from people. Put them together. And then we're all in the same system. But that's, you know, the, there are reasons why they're not doing that. Uh, I'm being told to be quiet. I'm going to put his hand up quite a lot. I'll take this last question. Uh, well, it's partially related. I mean, first of all, in terms of analysis, I think, I think it's quite interesting and quite important not to just go back either to New Labour, which is you know, the current government's continuity, or even to Thatcherism, God rest her soul. What? Oh, oh, really? But, that, but, but actually to, to the Labour government that preceded Thatcherism as well. I mean, we, we mustn't forget that, that the era we're in now actually began in the mid-70s, I would That's argue, right. in terms of the cut on the welfare state. So in, in terms of analysing the welfare state, which we still talk about, yeah. actually the welfare state that was constructed uh, post-war was, was, was well under tax under attack by the 70s, in advance of the 70s even. So I, I just think in terms of analysis, it's important to go back quite a long way to understand some of the crisis and, uh, the, uh, and some of the policies and the program that's been carried out by the current coalition. In terms of solutions, uh, I, yeah, I'd like to hear more from you, maybe from somebody else, about this notion of, uh, 
uh, of a citizen's income or a, or a living income. But I agree with you that at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is kind of reinventing social democracy. Uh, 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 and if you look, if you look at the Scandinavian model, I mean, for instance, one of my one of my kids lives and works in Norway. He's a relatively low-paid worker in that country. He pays 38% tax. And if you look at the social care system in Norway, you'll see why uh, he pays 38% tax. You know, it's a really key issue: is creating a proper redistributive uh, taxation system, going back to those sorts of basics. And, and I suppose. I agree with you, and I'll just make this final comment and then be quiet. I suppose my perspective, I'd go even a little bit further back. I think you can even go back to beyond beverage, but I'd go back to beverage. One of the things that I think is a failure on the left or on the, you know, on the non-left, but who, who want a decent welfare system, I think there are many on the right who want a decent welfare system, is to have kind of got a bit kind of caught by how wonderful that beverage is everything. Yeah, for its time, it was a good solution, but actually, it has the design flaws of many 1940 solutions. It's paternalistic, class-based. It was based on a kind of industrial model that no longer exists, and so on, could go on. But the, my point is, in a way, it's, it's not that the welfare state's a bad thing. The welfare state's a really, really good thing. But why do we think we designed it right in 1948, and all we've got to do is kind of tinker with it? I suppose what I'm really interested in is how do you get back down into the real nitty-gritty of what a decent society requires. And I'm not sure I have all the answers, but I think those are the kind of questions we need. And I think in terms of campaigning, one of the big challenges is, is I think it's quite natural to oppose this, oppose that, oppose the following. Okay, and that's fine. But it's actually quite a weak rhetorical position. Yeah, I mean, you might win the odd one, like the poll tax, but normally I would observe you lose. What wins is saying, I want this, we should have that, this is what we're going for. You see what I mean? And I think that one of the things we need to do is to, to start to dare to think differently about the welfare state. Mm -hmm. On that note, Tom. Good point. Thank you.